Igor Stravinsky, a famous Russian composer from the first half of the 20th century. He is perhaps best known for his ballet score, The Rite of Spring. The work is a classic, beautiful, powerful, rich music. Stravinsky uses his notes not only to build melodies and themes, but also to paint a picture through song and sound. For our purposes, though, perhaps we can just ignore the fact that the Rite of Spring is a story of pagan sacrifice. They're not bringing any bread to the temple here. Someone gets it at the end. The important part for us is that in 1913, Stravinsky debuted a musical score that was the likes of something no one had heard. It was so different, in fact, that at the initial performance, the audience rioted. Can you imagine high-class French people in their tuxedos and evening gowns getting violent in the theater? There were injuries, arrests. What bothered them so much? Stravinsky wrote no words with which one could disagree, nor any political statements that could offend. The music simply enraged them. Why? As the piece begins, a beautiful oboe solo opens the work. Based off of a folk tune, the melody is warm and captures the awakening and the warming experienced in springtime. The flutes then join in together, evoking a natural scene like birds flying up. But soon thereafter, the orchestra takes over with a bombastic, uncomfortable chord, an uncomfortable dissonant chord that becomes the work's signature theme. Over and over again, harmony gives way to discord. The music is more tense than it is melodic. Dissonance is the major feature of the music. That's something that was very, very unusual in 1913. It had never been heard in this way before. Dissonance in music signifies tension and conflict, and it begs resolution. The give and take between conflict and resolution in music is what our ears follow. It's what our emotions crave. It's what moves us forward. But continued rhythmic, pounding conflict that remains and only grows more intense. This was a sound completely new to the early 20th century ear. Recently, NPR's Radio Lab discussed why something like this could spark violence, rather than just evoke discord, dis, uh, disgust or offense. Science writer Joan O'Leary proposed that the listeners' brains were actually overwhelmed trying to decipher a new musical reality. Stravinsky's chords were combinations of sound that the listeners' auditory centers had never experienced. They overloaded. They flooded their brains with dopamine and caused the audience to go temporarily insane. They lashed out. They lacked control in their actions. Dissonance that does not resolve. Clashing sound bites that reach no compromise. A multitude of instruments capable of harmony together, but each section sounding its own cry. When it comes to Israel, it seems that we, the Jews, compose our symphony in this way. Last week, a number of us attended a lecture by Hartman scholar Yossi Klein Halevi. I haven't seen him lecture since he attended our HUC Israel seminar five years ago. His main concern then was the tenor of the Israel diaspora relationship. The specific events of the Middle East and Israel have changed markedly over the last five years. At that time, the Arab Spring had not yet begun, and ISIS was not in the picture. The main conflict shaping the Israel diaspora dialogue back then surrounded settlement construction, human rights, and the dismissal of non Orthodox conversions. But the past five years have only caused Yossi's thesis to become stronger. That Jews in Israel and Jews in the diaspora have a major problem in their communication. When it comes to political concerns, we lack empathy with each other. Last week, he cited as an example the wording 
of the letter to Congress signed by 440 rabbis, including many of our faculty, urging support for the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action, the new Iran deal. In Yossi's opinion, the letter's wording caused damage to the relationship between Israeli and American Jews. He felt the problem was not just the letter's support of the deal, but more importantly, how it failed to acknowledge his reality as an Israeli. The wording, in his view, ignored the ongoing fear of a nuclear Iran, a feeling shared by the majority of Israelis, both left and right. I'm not here to criticize the deal or to support it. I wish only to point out that no matter where you stand on the Iran deal, it is possible to see how Yossi reached his conclusion. The rabbinic letter is clear and concise. It does not mince words. It expresses one view unapologetically, and Israelis, like Yossi, can and do conclude the American community doesn't share the weight of the life and death matter. But I want to look more closely at Yossi's example, for this letter contains more than just an opinion on the Iran deal without a nod to the Israeli public's concerns. The rabbinic letter is also an artifact of a larger issue, one that goes beyond the disconnect between Israeli and American opinion. It sounds the tone of our own communal discord. The letter concludes with the following statement, and I quote, most especially, we are deeply concerned with the impression that the leadership of the American Jewish community is united in opposition to the agreement. We, along with many other Jewish leaders, fully support this nuclear agreement. 440 rabbis signed a public letter to Congress in support of a major initiative. 440 rabbis also signed a public letter to Congress where they felt compelled to defend themselves in the face of a falsely claimed unified position. The rabbinic letter was a genuine attempt to show leadership and strength. Many signed on, knowing well the gravity of what's at stake. A letter such as this one is actually an opportunity to display unity. But I'm concerned that its closing statement, while required in order to clarify a serious misrepresentation, actually highlights our divides. In the early 2012, Shema Journal published a series, a Shema Journal published a series of open letters from our own professor Stephen Winmuller and his associate Howard Friedman, at that time the chair of the Skirball Center. Together they debated the significance of having a unified Jewish, Jewish voice on matters of American politics. Dr. Winmuller voiced concern over the Jewish community's trend towards division and conflicting messages. He suggested that losing sight of a shared agenda leads to an angry social divide, one embroiled in controversy and discord. Winmuller claims three consequences. One, it harms our credibility. Two, it undermines our core interests. And third, it weakens our ability to participate forcefully in the public sphere. On the contrary, Friedman argues that the Jewish numbers in America aren't large enough anyways to matter even if we had a unified voice. Were we unified, our influence would not necessarily increase. And as in the case with Israel, we tag along as a Jewish community on shared interests between the United States and the Western world. Friedman adds that having a multitude of opinions actually signifies maturity in our thought and it should be seen as a respected attribute of our community. While Israel wasn't the only issue at the heart of their debate, Friedman and Winmuller also raise an important perspective. First, the strength of our influence matters. And second, a mature, nuanced analysis benefits from a steadfast foundation in fundamental shared principles. I wonder, though, how much we can really depend on our self-perceived maturity. After all, I can't think of anyone in the Jewish community, regardless of their feelings on the Iran deal, who wasn't deeply troubled by the level of vitriol that the debate generated this summer. We have lost sight of Ahavat Yisrael in the efforts to sound each of our own arguments above the other. 
Will our communal trends even allow us to develop a nuanced position as we go as a community down the road? Recently, a middle school class at a local synagogue, a speaker asked the students to share what they knew about Zionism. Silence. Blank stares. Bueller, anyone? <laughs> I can attest that these students are very smart and engaged. They surprise me each week with their ability to speak about Judaism in depth, and they share an advanced understanding of mitzvot, and they share a passion for tzedakah and doing justice in the world. They are deeply committed to their community, and many attend summer camps. But they remain very disconnected from Israel. In their paper, Beyond Distancing, Stephen Cohen and Ari Kelman professors found that the successive age cohorts are becoming more and more disconnected from Israel. As time progresses, we distance. It's not just how old you are, but rather the year that you were born says something about your chances for a deep relationship with Israel. As time marches on, the gap widens. With each successive generation, knowledge, familiarity, one's resolution their ability to know Israel in detail erodes. In the field of Israel education, we struggle to balance often competing interests uh, of, of students' resolution and their content versus how students develop their love, their connection to Israel. While as adults, they learn about troubling stories of Israel's creation, or they learn of the recent stabbing of rabbis for human rights leader Eric Escherman by a Jewish settler. How do they connect with Israel without the knowledge? A pounding cacophony of opinions, rhetoric, conflict. It's confronting today's learners who have not the ear nor the knowledge to decipher the message. This has become standard American Jewish discourse about Israel. A competition for which version of pro-Israel is the real pro-Israel. An orchestra of organizations playing divided opinions aloud at the same time. Despite their interest in advocacy and progress, they rarely sit at the same table or meet publicly face to face. They display little interest in forming harmony while their sound emanates from the same stage. It's Stravinsky in 1913. Only this time, we're the composers, and it's 2015. Our audience is full of listeners with little ability to decipher the message, but I'm afraid they won't riot in response. They'll just pick up their iPhones and tune it out. How can we help the dissonance reach momentary resolutions? What can help us find a balance between dissonance and harmony, or argument and compromise, that actually propels us forward as a community? Summer 2014, another war in Gaza. While working at Camp Newman, we watched and prayed while our 40 Israeli shlichim dealt with daily blows to their souls. Every morning, one or more of them burst into tears. A friend injured, a friend of a friend killed, a soldier they had trained in the army lost. Despite the trauma and stress, all 40 of them remained at camp, even though they knew we would understand completely and support them if they jumped ship and went back home. Campers and staff rallied around our shlichim. Together, we worked out how to discuss the experience as a community, how to ask questions without offending, and how to best explain the situation to our campers. Each Friday, the shlichim gave our staff updates on the operation and the news in Israel. There were maps, pictures, crash course history lessons, all delivered peer to peer. Then came Wednesday, July 30th. Matan Gottlieb, Omer Hai, and Guy Algranati of the elite Maglan unit were killed in Gaza. Our counselor and close friend, Elon, took the next flight out. He made it home for the last of the three funerals. Elon was in Maglan, too. Matan, Omer, and Guy were his best friends. They were a team. Elon had only left the army a month early 
to become a shaliach at camp. The American college students that work at camp, many of them fit the Israel disconnected cohort that Cohen and Kelman describe. But none of them remained in that category in the summer of 2014. I am convinced that without the shlichim at our camp, we would not have united and rallied around Israel and Israelis in the same way. Sure, we would have held programs. We would have sang songs for peace, written letters to soldiers, and so on. But there would not have been the ability to process in the way that we did. Having shlichim living in our community changed the conversation that summer. Rhetoric and politics gave way to learning about people. Their presence helped us build harmony in our own conversation and better relate to the situation in Israel. Our relationships came together to form an essential foundation of Ahavat Am Yisrael, a love for the people of Israel rather than just Israel alone. Of course, there remained a multitude of different opinions in the community. In fact, both Americans and Israelis shared the same concerns over some of Israel's actions that summer. The same topics were on our mind, human rights, settlement, the need for peace, Palestinian rights, our concerns about the government. But they didn't overshadow our common goals. We could talk openly and speak about these issues atop a firm footing of our more powerful unifying relationships. The conclusion was not this over that, but as the Talmud sometimes reminds us, elu ve'elu, multiple right answers can coexist. Each summer, over a thousand shlichim work at Jewish summer camps. The fruits of this exchange are priceless. Their presence allows us to see Israel through their eyes in ways that no textbook, video, lecture, or immersive simulation can hope to ever accomplish. The reverse is true as well. Shlichim return home having learned about and often coming to love progressive egalitarian Judaism. They also return knowing that their American peers support them and share their concerns. Shlichim work in communities during the year as well, but not in the same level of saturation. What if Shlichim worked in every synagogue, in every JCC, in every federation? What if we didn't just travel to Israel to study abroad or go there to tour, but we also went to work in their Jewish communities as American shlichim? Would we be better prepared to think, speak, write, and act about Israel? Our voices here as American Jews would come together as well from an experience such as this, and the tone of our discourse would change. Rabbi Ed Feinstein shares a moving Talmudic story in his book on Jewish tales. The story is about a rabbi in the Beit Midrash who sits up on a stack of pillows at the front of the room. His students face him, the best and the brightest, sitting in the front row. How do we know when night has ended and day begins, the rabbi asks. The answers begin to pour in. When I look out at the fields and I can distinguish between my field and the field of my neighbors, a second student replies. When I look from the field towards my house and I can distinguish my own house from the neighbor's house, the rabbi became angry. He was displeased by their wrong answers. And with each one, he had his assistant place another pillow under his seat. The lesson had barely begun, but he rose higher and higher and higher as his students hunched into their seats and lower, lower, lowered their heads. The teacher and the students grew farther apart until he was towering above them from his palace of comfortable pillows, angered that his students did not understand. Another student tried. When I look out, I can distinguish the animals in the yard from the flowers in the field. No, he shouted. You are all wrong. The students, bewildered, began to whisper amongst themselves. How could we be so wrong? What's wrong with him? My father's a farmer. Of course, I look to the fields for answers. Mine's a builder. Of course, I look to our home for understanding. And mine a planter. Of course, I look to the garden to teach me. The rabbi frowned again and responded, 
you only know how to divide. You divide from your house to your neighbor's house, from your field to your neighbor's field, from one form of life to another. Is that all we can do, divide and separate, split the world into pieces? No, my dear students. Our Torah and Jewish values demand more from us. The shock students looked into the sad face of their rabbi. One of them ventured, then rabbi, tell us, how do we know that the night has ended and the day has begun? The rabbi stared back into the faces of the students. With a gentle voice, he responded, when you look into the face of the person who is beside you, and you can see that that person is your brother or your sister or your friend, then you'll know that the night has turned into day. <coughs> On this day, when we remember the legacy of a great unifier, Yitzchak Rabin, I pray that we endeavor to build with our Jewish family a firm foundation of understanding and trust through personal face-to-face -face connection.